Number 10. Kristoff and Kadira Von Doom Kristoff and Kadira Von Doom are the children of Storm and Doctor Doom. They come from the novel series X-Men The Chaos Engine, which is actually a trilogy, wherein we explore what would happen if three great villains took control of the Marvel Universe, creating their own version of a perfect world using the Cosmic Cube. It starts off with Doom's variation on this world. In this reality, Doctor Doom has made Storm his wife, and she rules by his side as his empress. The union of these powerful characters produces two children, Kristoff and Kadira. We can assume, of course, that being the children of both Doom and Storm, that they would be physically, mentally, and demonstrably powerful when it came to their abilities, especially being raised by these two powerhouses. Also, if I wasn't clear about this, this is an alternate reality, so if you're like, when did this happen? It is not main continuity. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more children of the X-Men, they have a lot of kids if we you know, surf through the multiverse so we could do it for you. If you want that part three, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number nine, Nocturne. Nocturne is the daughter of Nightcrawler and Scarlet Witch. Obviously not from the main continuity. In fact, Talia Wagner is known for being a part of a multiversal hero team, the Exiles. Nocturne is from the alternate reality of Earth 2182. In fact, back on her home reality, which first appeared in Millennial Visions, Talia is also known as a member of the X-Men team fighting alongside her father, Nightcrawler, who is actually their field leader. She is a low-level telepath with incredible superhuman agility skills, the ability to wall crawl, and the ability to fire powerful brimstone hex energy bolts, something inherited from both her father and her mother. Nocturne's physical appearance is also similar to her father's, a bit demonic looking, and of course, blue. All my blue X-Men. <laughs> Top 10 blue X-Men. Actually, I feel like there's a lot of X-Men that are, that are blue. Or mutants that are blue, maybe? There's a lot of blue mutants, for sure. I don't know about X-Men team members. Number 8. Jimmy Hudson Jimmy Hudson is the son of Wolverine from the ultimate reality of Earth 1610. His powers are similar to his father's, but in this reality they are believed to work a little bit differently. As opposed to just being insane healing powers, Jimmy's power set in this universe as a mutant is believed to be based more in survival. So these powers aren't necessarily just about healing, but survival instincts and capability, meaning that Jimmy is just much better at surviving and evolving to survive than anyone else alive on the planet. It. And I mean that because in this reality, Wolverine eventually dies. So really, Jimmy is the only one left alive who's really good at surviving. Jimmy Hudson has also been bonded to a poison before and gained control of his poison, which are basically alien-like beings resembling symbiotes in look and abilities, but ultimately a different alien race themselves called poisons. So yeah. Jimmy is the son of Wolverine and Magneto's wife, Magda Lencher, although Wolverine urges him through a letter when the truth of his connection to Jimmy is revealed that he actually shouldn't focus too much on, you know, who his biological parents are. Jimmy was raised by adoptive parents. His dad actually served with Logan in the war and agreed to look after Jimmy in his father's place, even giving the young boy his own family name. Hudson. Number 7. Esme. Esme is one of the main Stepford Cuckoos. Well, I mean, I guess they're all pretty main, but you know what I mean. She's probably one of the most well known if we're talking offhand about how many of the Cuckoos you can name. Esme and the other Cuckoos are basically like the children of Emma Frost. Although, as I've said before, not children that she had consensually. And I didn't say that before in this list, but if you've heard me talk about the Stepford Cuckoos and their relation to Emma, yeah. Instead, these were lab babies basically made from Emma's eggs that were stolen from Emma while she was in a comatose state. Esme, like the other cuckoos, is kind of like a genetic clone as well as a child of Emma's, and Emma actually does consider the cuckoos to be like her daughters. She treats them as though they were her own flesh and blood, and often her own responsibility, kind of stepping in to like play mom sometimes, although she does give them freedom to make their own mistakes. I guess what I mean is Emma isn't known for being like a controlling kind of parent. She's like, I'm here when you need me, otherwise you do you. More recently in the comics, Esme, known for her diamond form and power powerful telepathic abilities, teamed up and primarily dated Young Cable. Well, technically all the cuckoos were dating him at one point, though I would say Esme was basically the main, main squeeze of Young Cable and the sister that he was most taken by while he was dating all of them. And if you're like, whoa, how did that happen? The Stepford Cuckoos, they share things because they're kind of like a hive mind. So they're like, we'll just all date this person. Is cool. Also, Krakoa. Everyone's dating everyone. <laughs> Number six, Akahiro. Akahiro is the son of Wolverine and his wife, Itsu. Unfortunately, before Akahiro was even born, his life took a turn 
for the worse. Along with inheriting his father's powers, I think he also inherited some of his tragic, tragic luck. Wolverine has the worst luck, I think. His mother, Itsu, was killed before she could give birth to him, assassinated. The child was believed dead, but in reality, he had been cut from her womb and possibly, due to his inherited healing powers, miraculously survived. Although, that's not clear because usually your powers don't manifest until puberty, but sometimes your powers manifest when you're in the womb. I mean, look at Professor X with Cassandra Nova. Apparently that's a thing that happened. Akihiro would grow up and become a pawn of the villain known as Romulus. For most of his life, he'd also be known as Dokken, a cruel nickname given to him when he was a child being raised by his adoptive parents. The nickname was given to him because of his mixed race appearance, being part American and part Japanese. Though to be clear, his parents weren't the ones that gave it to him. It was people around his parents. Akahiro's powers are similar to Wolverine's, though his bone claws are a little bit different in terms of placement and appearance. Like his father, Akahiro is also known for being a skilled fighter as well. The apple does not fall far from the tree when it comes to fighting abilities. Number 5. Xandra Naramani Xandra is Professor X's daughter, who is created out of his genetic material and that of his lover's genetic material, the Shi'ar Magistrix Lalandra Naramani, after both of them were believed dead. As such, Xandra grew up to become Shi'ar royalty and also so spent a good amount of her life hunted because of this, with various parties attempting to use her for their own means. Xandra is an extremely gifted telepath. She can manipulate others' minds, read minds, and can create hyper-realistic telepathic illusions. Number 4. Ruby Summers She was the ex-offspring used in our oh-so-clickable thumb for the part 1 to this list, and although she was on my extended list for that part 1, my like long brainstorm that I came up with, I didn't get around to talking about her because I kind kind of reached a point where there were too many Summers children on that list. And I was like, I don't want to make this a top 10 children of Cyclops. We got that list. And also, that's not what this list is. What can I say? Sykes got strong genes. That's why Mr. Sinister is so obsessed after all and is known as the number one fan of the Summers Club. Scott Summers is Ruby's dad in the alternate reality she hails from and Emma Frost is her mother. This makes Ruby fairly powerful, not at the level of Hope or X-Man, but still pretty impressive. She's also super cool looking, which is an added bonus. Ruby hails from the alternate Earth of 1191, the home reality of famous X-Men ally Bishop. Ruby is also capable of emitting optic blasts like her dad and his brothers, but she has more control over when and how she emits these blasts. Unlike her dad, who's like, I literally need a visor. Ruby also comes with her Ruby form, which like her mother's diamond form, grants her invulnerability and pretty much immortality. Number 3. Olivier Raven Olivier Raven is legally known as Olivier LeBeau, and is one of the alternate reality children of Gambit and Rogue. Honestly, I feel like there are not enough of these kids out in the multiverse. I don't know if that's just me. For a couple as famous as Gambit and Rogue, I mean, you just, you would think that we'd have a lot more kids from them, at least through the multiverse. Though admittedly, I'm not quite sure that Rogue and Gambit are really the kid having type, that, at least from what I've seen in the main continuity. They seem pretty content with just having their fur babies right now. So maybe they just aren't super into having kids as a family. Olivier hails from the reality of Earth 41001, the reality of Gen Next, a group Ollie is part of. He has powers similar to his mother's, except he has better control over them and is able to choose when and how much power, life energy, and memories he absorbs via physical contact, or doesn't absorb in cases where he just, you know, wants to make physical contact without using his powers. He can also absorb powers on a more permanent level, although he has less control, it seems, over when this happens. Like his father, he also seems to have some charm based powers. Either that, or he's just charming. Number 2. Proteus Proteus is the son of Moira McTaggart, who before I would count more as like an ex-ally, but with recent revelations we can definitely consider her a member in the same way we might consider someone like Charles Xavier. It turns out that Moira herself was a mutant this whole time, possessing unique reincarnation powers. She has also been known for being a leader and teacher of X-Men groups before, including the time when she led a team that Professor X then recruited, sending them into Krakoa to rescue rescue the original X-Men. Not Krakoa as we know it now, but Krakoa as it was back in the day when it was like a monster island. Proteus is Kevin McTaggart, son of Joseph and Moira McTaggart. He is currently one of the five on Krakoa and his powers as part of that team are mainly used to warp reality, allowing the non-viable eggs that egg, formerly known as gold balls, produces to become viable for life. These eggs are then used to grow new versions of fallen mutants. Proteus is an omega level mutant who requires hope 
to survive. Initially, Kevin had a body, but now he's basically just pure energy. The hosts he controls and feeds off of eventually are exhausted and killed by that energy drain, making him not just a powerful psionic mutant, but also a powerful energy vampire as well, unintentionally. Number 1. Legion Legion is the son of Professor Charles Xavier that was conceived when he had a love affair with Gabrielle Holler, which is where Legion gets his legal last name, as his given name is David Holler. Legion is so powerful because he suffers from a severe disassociative identity disorder, where he has more than one hundred personas residing within him. Each persona has a number, many of names, and they each have their own specific power set that show up whenever they take over. Because of this, there is almost nothing that Legion isn't capable of. He can manipulate matter and time. We've seen him time travel and completely warp reality as a result of his possible abilities. He also has some pretty powerful hair, which I gotta say, I'm happy that he still rocks even now in the current modern day comics. He's still got that sweet hair. So tall. Number 10. Crusader. Crusader Crusader is the daughter of X-Men team member Rogue and Avenger Captain America. I know. A weird combination. But in the reality of Earth 9811, these two ended up together after the heroes and villains on Battleworld decided to call a truce. Remaining there, they settled down and raised families, putting their differences aside. I'm not sure how their relationship worked with Rogue not really being able to touch people in all of this point, or how she had a child considering that. But perhaps, like on Earth 616, she eventually was able to work through the trauma causing this side effect of her powers. Or perhaps the Captain America of Earth 9811 was immune to her involvement voluntary energy and power draining effects. Either way, Sarah is their daughter. She gets much of her power from her mother, or rather she gets much of her power from the power her mother had absorbed in her day, meaning that Sarah is super strong, durable, and can fly. She is also considered worthy enough to lift Thor's hammer and wields her father's shield. Number 9. Wolverine I really wanted to put Laura Kinney higher up on this list because, well, I love her so much, but unfortunately the psionics are just always pushing some of my favorite and most powerful characters further down on these lists. Those psionics. Oh well. Laura Kinney as X-23 and now Wolverine is still one of the most powerful children of the X-Men around. Some argue that she is more clone, while others argue that she is more biological offspring of Logan, but in reality, she's kind of a bit of both. She was created as a female clone of Wolverine after his genetic material was combined with that of her creator, scientist Sarah Kinney. Sarah noticed that there were damaged spots basically in the samples of Logan's genetic material that they had, which was why their cloning process had been unsuccessful up to this point, and so she used her own genetic material to patch those rough spots, which made Laura a female clone. Sarah was forced to carry Laura to term as a surrogate by her jealous colleague Xander Rice, as punishment for even creating the female clone to begin with, a strategy that admittedly had not been approved. Laura has power similar to her father. She is a regenerative healing factor and was also trained from birth to be a skilled fighter, bodyguard, and assassin. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to learn about more children of the X-Men, there are a lot out there in the multiverse. Be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8. Chimera Chimera is the daughter of Storm and likely Black Panther who hails from the alternate reality of 13729. Yeah, sadly Storm and T'Challa have never had a child together in the main continuity. I know, it's a bit of a bummer. Unless they had like a real secret child that we just don't know about yet, but I doubt it. Chimera seems to have inherited the powers of her mother but also shares a connection to the Earth, which allows her to draw on and harness its energy. She is also a skilled tracker and can communicate telepathically with animals. I'd also assume as she's the daughter of Storm that she's a skilled combatant as well. As while Storm is more well known for her goddess status and weather manipulation powers, she is also an extremely skilled fighter. And if she's Black Panther's daughter then she should definitely be a skilled fighter. I mean you got two amazing parents that are both amazing fighters. So. Just saying. Number seven, Charles Xavier the second. Charles Xavier the second is the son of Charles Xavier and Mystique. If you can believe that, I know it's pretty shocking. Charles Xavier number two was technically born into the reality of Earth 616, where we later find out that while Mystique actually took the form of Moira when giving birth, Charles actually knew that he was in a relationship with Raven. So it wasn't like a trick of hers. They were actually just wanted to be together, I guess. This version of Charles, however, is an all grown up one from the alternate future of Earth one. 3729. When his powers first manifested, he accidentally killed his adoptive mother and ended up later joining forces with his half-brother Raze, another child of Mystique's 
sired by Wolverine, another child of the X-Men. Charles Xavier II has a brilliant and conniving mind and, like his father, is an immensely gifted telepath, capable of using his powers to bend others to his will. Number 6. Polaris Polaris is the daughter of Magneto, and while you might not think of Magneto as being an X-Men considering, you know, he started out as an X-Men villain, he has also worked with the team before and even served as a member himself. Heck, at one point he was in charge of the whole New Mutants crew, let's not forget that. Magneto may have some questionable methods when it comes to getting justice that put him on the spectrum of villain, but I think at the end of the day he's just trying to do what's best for mutants. Or at least what he thinks is best for mutant kind. Polaris, like her father, also has magnetic based powers which, like her father, are also pretty impressive. Polaris is considered an alpha level mutant and recently got to join the X-Men team herself after being elected to join them in the Krakoan X-Men elections. Psychic elections. Imagine if we could all just vote psychically. That would be awesome. That would be so much easier. You would just like sit down and you'd be like, who do I want to vote for? Mmm, done. Number 5. Cable Cable is the son of Scott Summers, aka Cyclops, non-X-member Madeline Pryor, who later becomes the villain known as the Goblin Queen, and another X-Man's, Jean Grey, who kind of becomes like an adoptive mother but who also possesses Madeline's memories of raising baby Christopher. Cause comics. Cable is Nathan Christopher Charles Summers, often referred to as just Nathan Summers or really just Cable. Although back in the day we did know him as Baby Christopher. Cable as a baby was kidnapped by Apocalypse and infected with the techno organic virus. This is the only thing that makes him weak ish, but really he is still amazingly strong as he can even fend off that virus, containing it to one side of his body using his psionic powers. That in and of itself is pretty impressive as the techno organic virus is generally known for being being, well, unstoppable. Even with his psionic powers mainly preoccupied, Cable is still a hard one to beat, as he has so many combatant based skills that he brings to the table, and he is also an experienced time traveler besides. Number 4. Rachel Summers Yes, get ready, because many of the most powerful X kids out there just happen to be Summers related, so yeah, get ready for that. Honestly, I've always wanted to do a video just to explain the complicated nature that is the Summers and Grey family tree, which honestly is a lot, and it's very timey wimey. Rachel herself is one of those very complex kids of theirs. She is the daughter of Jean Grey and Scott Summers from the alternate Earth of 811. In that reality, she was made into a hound, a weapon used to hunt down mutants, even being one herself. Rachel is an extremely powerful telepath and telekinetic who also has the ability to chrono skim and manipulate time, even traveling through it. Rachel is also known for being an avatar of the Phoenix, at one time actually considered the true avatar for it, but then later having the power sort of dialed down to a mere echo of it. So she was no longer the true avatar, they were just like, you just have a thing, and it's not even like the real Phoenix Force, but it's like a version of it. Still, the seeming peace or echo of the Phoenix Force that resides within her has been known to flare up from time to time, or her connection to the Phoenix Force, however we want to see that, occasionally boosting Rachel to an off the charts level of power. But like I said, that doesn't happen all the time. Number 3. Hope Summers Hope is the adopted daughter of Cable, who was originally known as the Mutant Messiah Baby. Cable saved Hope from Bishop, who basically wanted to destroy her. In Bishop's reality, the Mutant Messiah would end up causing the event that led to the oppression and personal Execution of mutants. However, in Cable's reality, the mutant Messiah would grow up to become a savior. So you can see why these two were opposed on this topic. For the X-Men of Earth 616, the mutant Messiah was the first new mutant to have been born since basically M Day. And so she brought hope to the mutants of the 616 reality. Cable body slided with hope to another time to raise her in safety. He would end up naming Hope after her adoptive mother, his love who died, Hope. And she got the Summer's name from Cable himself. But although she looks a lot like Jean, she actually has no biological relation to the Summers or the Grey families, at least not that we know of. Hope's mutant abilities allow her to copy the powers of anyone within a certain range. Hope also gains access to these powers without struggling at all to use them, receiving them basically at their peak level and with the, the auto knowledge basically of how to use them. So if you're like, oh she's gotta like figure it out, no she's just like instant god mode with those powers basically. Number 2. Scarlet Witch Wanda is known for being one of the most powerful beings in the Marvel Universe. She has used her her powers to completely warp reality the world over, and her chaos magic has pulled off other immensely world changing feats, such as flipping the alignment of all major heroes and villains in the comics during the events of Axis. Initially, her chaos magic powers were believed to be somewhat mutant in origin. In fact, they were kind of presented initially as like jinx like mystical mutant abilities during her first appearances. However, we've since learned that both Wanda and her superpowered brother Pietro, aka Quicksilver, were never really mutants at all, nor were they related to. 
Magneto. However, they still spend a good amount of their life around Magneto, who secretly believed them to be his children, and then another good amount of time thinking that he was their actual father, until it was revealed that this was all due to manipulation by the High Evolutionary. High Evolutionary just coming in and messing pretty much everybody up when it comes to their backstories and origins. Wanda herself has never really gotten along with the X-Men, especially since the events of M-Day, but she is still considered, I think, a part of Magneto's family, and a powerful one at that, regardless of her status as a mutant or a non-mutant. I know there are some people out there that want to be like, it never happened, but like, they still spent a lot of time together thinking that they were family, so I think we can still count it, friends. Also, make Wanda a mutant again. Do it. Make it happen. Give me Wanda and Quicksilver back. Number 1. X-Man X-Man is Nathaniel Grey, the lab-born child made by combining the genetic materials of both Jean Grey and Cyclops. So basically, like Cable, but if he had been made perfectly by villain Mr. Sinister. He actually hails from the alternate reality of AOA, Age of Apocalypse, Earth 295. Here, Sinister created him to use as his own weapon, but of course, Nate being so powerful, managed to escape Sinister and instead ended up being raised by Forge of Earth 295. He is considered one of the most powerful mutants of all time, which would also make him one of the most powerful children of the X-Men out there. Nate can warp reality, resurrect the dead, resurrect himself, travel to alternate Earths and dimensions, and even manipulate the time stream. He is basically the most OP of characters when it comes to the Marvel Universe. And if you've seen artwork of him, you will probably recognize him as someone who looks like Mutant Jesus. Which, yes, he is god level, so that is the point. Number 10, Deathlock Prime. Deathlock Prime hails from the reality of Earth 10511, where in this future the Roxxon Corporation takes over the world. While not a mutant, he is a member of the X Force, who is also seen as a member of the staff for a short time in the Jean Grey School of Higher Learning. Deathlock Prime is actually a human cyborg in regards to his origin, but this doesn't stop him from lending his expertise and advice to the students of the Jean Grey School. While there, Deathlock Prime gives a guest lecture and even tells some of the kids what their futures might end up being probably based on his own future. He also warns Wolverine about Evan Sabiner, aka Kid Apocalypse, who later takes the code name of Genesis himself. Deathlock Prime says that Evan could either be a hero or a deadly enemy of the mutants. Number 9, Quicksilver. Okay, so a lot of people in the comments for the part one of this list really wanted me to include folks like Franklin Richards, aka Powerhouse, Scarlet Witch, and her brother Quicksilver on that list, or on a potential part two. Here is the problem with that. While Franklin, Wanda, and Pietro were all once considered mutants and yet are no longer, none of them were technically members of the X-Men team, which is why I couldn't really put any of them on that list. Wanda is a first and foremost an Avenger and former X-Men villain, but not really an X-Men member. Franklin is always with the Fantastic Four or Future Foundation, and while he spent some time on Krakoa prior to losing his powers and mutant status, still, once again, not an X-Men. Quicksilver is the closest that we've got, which is why I've included him at the impassioned behest of a good number of you. So Quicksilver is here for you, He's speeding on into the list. Quicksilver was never on the X-Men team, but was a member of one of the X-Factor teams. And while many people forget this fact, as it's no longer considered, I guess, the most iconic iteration of the team, the X-Factor team, the original one anyways, was created to actually be a team for the original X-Men to be on when they made their return to the spotlight years later, but the name was already basically taken at that point by a newer team featuring sort of the next era of mutant heroes, such as Wolverine, Rogue, and Storm. The version of the X-Factor team that Quicksilver was a part of was also a return to that original team's government-funded roots, which the first X-Factor team was government funded. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to show your love for this channel in a different way, you can head on over to Facebook where you can give us a follow, give us a like, and do all the Facebook-y things. Number 8, Elisande Stewart. Elisande Stewart was one of the founding members of the British Who, or at least one of the most important members of that organization, which also stands for the Weird Happenings Organization, I believe. <laughs> As a result of her work, Elisande would often run into and team up with the Excalibur team. Later on, she ended up also being considered a member of the unofficial Muir Island X-Men team, as she aimed to help defend Muir Island from the Reavers. Alison Stewart herself is just a normal human lady, not a mutant. She serves in the British Army, where she holds the rank of Brigadier. Or at least, she did hold that rank. She's technically dead now. She was framed by a rival organization and later killed without much thought by Jamie Braddock while he was using his reality warping powers. As Jamie is 
want to do. Number seven, Kid Gladiator. Kid Gladiator, despite not being a mutant, actually attended the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning himself. On part one of this list, I talked about his sort of bodyguard turned school staff member Warbird, but I didn't make Q-Bark his own point. So here we go. Kid Gladiator is the son of Gladiator, aka Calark, and as such can be extremely powerful due to his physiology and his heritage. However, as a kid, this kind of became a problem. At one point, he destroyed half of the Shi'ar royal city, Shandalar, just because, well, he could. As such, his punishment was to go to Earth and learn how to better control and use his powers at the Jean Grey School, which I feel like he took as a punishment, but maybe Calark was also like, look, you just need to like, you just need to figure it out, okay? Can't just go destroying cities and such. Number six, Deadpool. Deadpool definitely wasn't a member of the X-Men because they wanted him there. While Deadpool has a long history with the X-Force team, when it comes to the mainstay team of the X-Men, the mutant staple team at Marvel Comics, Deadpool was actually only permitted to be a kind of like an honorary member. I mean, he was given full membership, so technically he's a member. So that the X-Men could keep a closer eye on Wade, basically. Deadpool desperately was searching for his purpose in life and got it in his head that joining the X-Men was the best way for him to be a hero. He ended up leaving the X-Men team after helping them out with a problem that they believed he'd actually caused, but in reality, he was kind of just like framed for. Well, I guess in the end, the X-Men kind of like kicked him off the team, but he also was gonna leave anyway. So there. Number five, Dr. Kavita Rao. Dr. Dr. Kavita Rao is an important ally and friend to mutant kind, who was once a very misguided and powerful enemy. She attempted to cure the legacy virus when it was running rampant, but failed to do so before Beast, Hank McCoy did. Later, she was then approached to create a cure for the mutant gene, with the understanding that it would not be used by force, but would simply be given to those that wanted it, people whose powers were basically super dangerous and had potentially even ruined their lives in some cases. Dr. Rao decided to accept the task. She successfully created a serial which turned mutants into humans. The cure was named Hope. After it was revealed that whole plot was about exterminating mutant kind, Dr. Rao submitted to the will of the X-Men. They destroyed her research with only Hank keeping the last sample of the Hope serum. In the end, her villainous actions later inspired Dr. Rao to set down a path of redemption after the events of M-Day. She joined a team of scientists brought together by Beast to help bring back mutant kind. Dr. Rao would remain working with and alongside the X-Men throughout their utopia days and was later a staff member for the Jean Grey School of Higher Learning. Number four, Dupe. Despite Dupe being a glorious weirdo, he's never really been confirmed as a mutant. We don't really know what exactly Dupe is. He is either a mutant or some kind of possibly alien or being from another dimension. But the bottom line is, it's never been explicitly verified and set in stone what his origin is. And honestly, this is Dupe we're talking about, so I don't think it ever will be. As a result of all that, he's a candidate for this list, despite being maybe one of the weirdest teammates, mutant or no. Dupe has had many adventures with the X-Men and was even the receptionist at the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning, joining up with and aiding Wolverine there. He's also been seen on Krakoa since then. It's clear that Dupe feels most at home among mutants, and that that is a place where he gets to be, even if he isn't a mutant. Number three, Amanda Sefton. Amanda Sefton is the adopted sister of mutant and X-Men member Nightcrawler. She is also one of Kurt's major love interests. Yeah, it's complicated. Amanda was actually an alias that she adopted when she went to investigate what her adopted brother Kurt was up to after the death of their brother Steven was kind of pinned on Kurt. Undercover Jemaine Zardos, which is her real name, became Amanda Sefton, and it was during this time that Kurt would actually fall in love with her, not recognizing I don't think that Amanda was his sister Jemaine at the time. At least, I'm pretty sure he didn't recognize that. I'm not sure if she really even changed her appearance, so. It's a whole weird thing. Jemaine, or Amanda as we more commonly know her now, is a powerful sorceress, but is not a mutant, and has been an ally to the X-Men, also belonging to their unofficial Muir Island team. Number two, Spider-Man. Spider-Man has been a longtime friend to the mutants. Although they initially got off on the wrong foot when they first ran into each other in the comics, they eventually realized that they were both on the side of good and ended up becoming friends and allies. Spider-Man in the 90s animated series even goes to the X-Men for help, hoping they can actually cure him, but only to learn that Professor X isn't so much about like curing anyone as he is about helping mutants find their place and their way. There is also the matter of the fact that Spider-Man isn't really even that 
that kind of mutant. He's considered a mutate, having his genetic makeup altered by that radioactive spider bite, and possibly also by his fate to become Spider Man as a preordained spider totem in the web of life and destiny, which is also a thing. Spider Man at one point isn't just a member of the team, he actually has his own team of mutants that he himself is responsible for teaching. How cool is that? Special class. Number 1 Longshot While some might think of Longshot as a mutant, he doesn't consider himself as such. He is believed to be the clone and possibly both the father and son of Shatterstar. Things get weird in the Mojoverse and Longshot is basically like kind of a paradoxical time loop in and of himself in terms of him and his heritage. As is Shatterstar in some ways, and kind of as is Spiral as well too. Shatterstar himself is a genetically engineered mutant and Longshot is a clone of him, but despite that tie to sort of mutant dumb or mutant kind, albeit a genetically engineered version of mutant kind, he doesn't consider himself to be a mutant. Longshot was instantly liked by the X-Men when they first found him and ended up joining the team in fighting back against Mojo. Initially, he didn't actually remember who he was or much about himself and spent a good amount of time on those first adventures with the X-Men team trying to recover his own lost memories. Kicking off the list at number 10, M. Monet St. Croix made her first appearance in Generation X issue 1 as Penance, and by the time issue 40 rolled around, she was introduced as Monet. She was the second child of Ambassador Cartier St. Croix, who was a wealthy former president of numerous corporations. Now, although she had an older brother and two young twin sisters, her father still favored her. Now, her brother Marius had mutant abilities, and when they manifested, he became evil. Sadly, he actually took out his mother and was kicked out of the family, and then he asked Monet to join him, traveling through other dimensions, gaining power. She was like, nope. I'm good, thanks. So she rejected him, and Marius trapped her in this form of a mute creature with diamond hard red skin. And he fed on her powers. What a not nice guy. It's awful. So Claudia and Nicole, her sisters, the twins, they joined forces. Like, literally. They merged into a new version of Monet. And it was all pretty much the same personality, appearance, and powers. M is a telepathic genius, and of course, super strength and super speed sure does help her get the job done. Before we continue on with this list, guys, if you want to go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be great. It does help our channel quite a bit. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for watching. Let's go right back into this list. I don't want to waste any more time. Number nine, Frenzy. Okay, Joanna Cargill. She made her first debut in X Factor issue four. Now, she accidentally punched her father so hard that her hand went through his chestal plate which is just a great way to find out you have powers. Now her father was in no means a good person at all, but still finding out you're a mutant in that way is pretty rough. That's pretty traumatizing for a young kid. So she became known as Frenzy and she joined the Allegiance of Evil. Now after the Acolytes disbanded, Joanna became ambassador for Genosha and stood by Magneto until she was captured by the US government in order to learn more about Magneto, but she didn't talk. She was a tough one. She didn't talk until Jean Grey entered and freed her, giving her the option to join the X-Men the easy way or the hard way. Jean used the hard way and then Frenzy's entire attitude was changed. Her personality was like campy, it was awkward, not nearly as confident as before, but her powers were still there. She did help the X-Men find Magneto's base. She was a team member, even if it was forced and campy. So after Magneto's defeat, her mind control was released and she rejoined the Acolytes and then left the X-Mansion. Super speed, super strength, super stamina, super everything, you name it, she's got it. Her body has been described as being hard as steel, making the She-Hulk put up quite a fight. Number 8, Armor. Hisako Ichiki made her first appearance in Astonishing X-Men Volume 3, Issue 4. Now, she grew up in Japan before joining the Xavier Institute. She formed a close relationship with Wing and Blindfold once she joined Katie Pride's Paladin Squad. Now, her new close friends were being attacked one day by Ord of Breakworld, so Armor used her unique mutant abilities to take care of him with a mighty punch. She can create the psionic exoskeleton suit of armor, hence the name Armor. It's fueled by the energy of Hisako's ancestors. In the Ultimate Universe, her abilities create quite the spectacle as well. They appear in the shape of these massive animals, these great beasts, even dragons at some point. As if these abilities weren't surprising and fantastic enough, she also received combat training from Wolverine and tactic training from Cyclops. So she's kind of a big deal. Number seven, Vulcan. He named himself after the Roman god of fire, but Vulcan's real identity was that of Gabriel Summers. He was born after Cyclops and Havoc, well, not really. He wasn't really born. He was actually surgically removed from his mother's body and placed in an incubator accelerator, then aged to be at his prime and then sent to Earth 
to work for Dak and Shikari. One of those normal childhoods, you know? So he escaped and he was found by Mora McTaggart with no memories of who he is or where he came from. Poor kid. So we asked for Charles' help and then all Kid Vulcan wanted to do was learn about his mutant abilities. Sounds like the perfect student. Like, come on, you're doing all the right things. Charles needed help from him and other newcomers to find the remaining X-Men. So Charles put him in this danger room as a training exercise to get them sharp in a short amount of real time. So it felt like months of training, but in fact, it's only a few hours. And then Vulcan and this new team were sent to Krakoa to rescue the original X-Men. But Vulcan revealed to Scott that Xavier sacrificed his own brother to save him. Number six, Maggot. That's a fun name right off the bat, Maggot. Maggot, or I mean, Japheth, first appeared in Uncanny X-Men issue 345. He was born with five siblings, but never grew at the same rate as them. And on top of that, he had struggled with pains in his stomach. Sadly, those pains turned out to maybe be cancer, and he feared that he would run his family dry with medical bills. So at just age 12, he left the South African village and started to think of a dark solution to his problem. Super tragic. So he ended up in the Kalahari Desert and was found by Magneto, who figured out that these stomach issues were actually these two slug-like creatures that lived in the boy's body, and they acted as his digestive system. Years later, Maggot reached out to Magneto in hopes that he would help him with this gross situation. Now the slugs, named Eenie and Meenie, because that's what you do when you have slugs, you give them cute nicknames. They were these sentient techno-organic slugs that could devour anything. Doesn't matter what kind of matter you are, gone, devoured. They would do it fast too, not at the pace of normal slugs. And once lunchtime was finished, they would return back to Japheth's stomach, transferring the energy from what they just consumed, granting him super strength and durability. Also, he had a nice avatar tan to go along with these magnificent abilities. Number five, Kid Omega. Now again, the word kid is used lightly in this list. You do not want to underestimate Quentin Quire, aka Kid Omega. He made his first appearance in X-Men issue 134. He's been described as one of the most powerful telepaths next to Jean Grey. So off the bat, you know you're in for a treat. He was one of Xavier's prized pupils. That is until, of course, he put together the Omega Gang, which was this gang that would handle humans after they've committed crimes against mutants. They would do it themselves, not in a poetic way, to say the least. They were like the super kid police. They even went to a tattoo shop and made it official. They got these Omega symbols tattooed over top of the X. Now his abilities are insane. He can manipulate your perception, judgment, wills, and common sense. He's able to track you down by listening to your thoughts, folks. Your thoughts, you can hear your thoughts. And even in this instance, if you were a telepath, you wouldn't see him coming because he would block out your powers to sneak up on you. One of the coolest things about Quentin is the psionic shotgun that he can create. It just looks cool. He just channels all this mental energy as this astral energy shotgun. And if that doesn't do the trick, yeah, the psionic rocket launcher should. Number four, Kubark, AKA Kid Gladiator, another kid. Kubark is the son of Emperor Gladiator. He was this young prince sent to earth to train and discover more secrets about his powers. And the one place you go and do that is of course the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning. Warbird was his bodyguard. And the reason that he was sent to earth, this new kid on the block, was because he destroyed more than half of the Shi'ar royal city on Chandelar just for fun, you know? In Wolverine and the X-Men, he arrives and starts giving orders to other students, like to bring him snacks, the whole thing. And he wanted these students to call him their new Imperial Overlord. He's jam-packed with superpowers though. He can possess the ability to fly and his eyes are pretty interesting, not just to look at. He has microscopic vision and can blast heat beams through those peepers. And with an incredible lung capacity, he can take in large amounts of air and blast it out, creating these hurricane-like winds. And if that doesn't work, he can use his breath to freeze you dead in your tracks. Number three, Lifeguard, AKA Heather Cameron. Lifeguard is such a cool character. Okay, let's talk about her. She's super unique. She made her first debut in Extreme X-Men issue six. And judging by her name, yes, she of course started off as a lifeguard and also as a surfer. Her mutant ability is that of a lifeguard, literally. Her powers allow her to manifest whatever is needed to save the life of somebody near her. If you're allergic to peanuts, bam, EpiPen, stab, we're good. She's like the super medic of the X-Men. She's awesome. After the events of M-Day, Heather was one of the lucky to retain her abilities. She's almost a combination of Darwin and Mystique. Now I talked about Darwin in part one of this list, so if you want a little bit of catching up to do, you know where to find that. Number two, Zeitgeist. Axel Clooney. He was seen in Deadpool 2 and he made his first comic book appearance in X-Force issue 116. His ability, mm, let's just talk about it. He can spit acid, like a lot of acid, so much acid. It can eat through any substance and I think what makes this character even more wild is when he himself discovered these powers for the first time. Oh boy, okay. He was at the beach hanging out. He met this lovely woman. They clicked, it was romantic. They were nice. They were kissing on the beach. And then all of a sudden this, uh, this happens. A lot of acid puke. 
A lot of puke, real nasty stuff. Ugh. But this guy is super powerful. Like he can take on so many mutants. I mean, it's gross, but if only he didn't spew it out of his mouth, maybe he had fingers that could do the acid shooting, he'd be less of a gag. Pun intended. And finally coming in at number one, Jubilee. Making her first appearance in Uncanny X-Men issue 244, Jubilee, aka Jubilation Lee, first discovered her mutant power of generating these dazzling sparkles from her hands. She was always seen as this little sister type character from the start, but she packs a powerful pretty punch. She was discovered by Dazzler, Cycloc, Rogue, and Storm during a rescue at the mall, and when she followed the women back through a portal, she ended up at the X-Men's temporary base in the Australian Outback. Jubilee and Wolverine ended up becoming a good pair, working missions together, and they were a fun duo. Now her powers grew to a whole new level, when a vampire ended up infecting the area of Union Square. This happens in Curse of the Mutants, and Jubilee being caught in the path of this infection ended up becoming a vampire. It's, it's a pretty big deal. Even before the vampire stuff, this is a highly underrated character to this day. Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Mimic. Calvin Rankin came into comics in X-Men 19. He was the son of a scientist, and when he was just a child, he knocked over a beaker filled with this experimental chemicals, okay? Now this red gas emerged and he inhaled it, so now he has this amazing ability where he can mimic anybody else's powers. They just have to be standing close by. Now the team at first is trying to take him down, but they're failing, of course, as he's just adapting to their every move. So while this ability does sound like one of the best, it kind of just depends on who's near you. I mean, he's not too powerful, but he is. If you're the one that's powerful, that's near him. See what I mean? So if you're hanging out with Mimic, he may just seem pretty normal. That's because, well, shocker, you're just pretty normal. You can't fly, you can't shoot lasers out of your eyes. But if Cyclops came along, all of a sudden, this guy is totally different. You're still a boring human. Now he's another Cyclops. How unfair is that? And before we continue on with this list, guys, if you wanna go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be awesome. It really does wonders for our channel. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for watching. Now let's get right back into these crazy mutants. Number nine, not another teen mutant. Okay, this next one is a one-off, okay? He doesn't have a name exactly, so we'll just refer to him as Teen Mutant from now on. Not a Teen Mutant Ninja Turtle, just a Teen Mutant. Well, you'll see, it's kind of crazy. At first, he looks like a regular kid. He's got posters on his wall, one of which is Wolverine with the caption, be different right below it, but we'll talk about that a little later because uh, he may have taken that a little too literally. So he wakes up, he's ready for school, he's looking for breakfast. His mom is nowhere to be seen, only a pile of her clothes remain on the ground. So he doesn't call the police, but rather he just writes a note, sticks it, and then goes to school. If you ever wake up and there's just clothes left, call the police no matter what. That's That comes first. On the way to school, he sees there's just a collar lying on the sidewalk. Just a collar, no animal. Okay, odd. What's going on? Finally, he sees people. He's like, okay, great. I'm not going crazy. Whew, that was a close one. But I bet that he wished that that was the case after what's about to happen. So he has this neat ability where people just don't survive being close to him. They kind of explode. It's pretty gross. And he hears it from the guy in that poster himself. He hears it from Wolverine when he finds him ducking out in a cave. So what happened was when he hit puberty, he developed a specific mutation that radiates a series of toxins and acid-like poisons. So it wipes out any organic tissue in its way. It turns it into vapor. So the number of people that he ended up taking out that day was a whopping 265. And you thought he was just another blonde-haired teen heartthrob. Think again. Number eight, El Guapo. This next one, I don't think I would even notice this mutant if he was standing right in front of my very eyes. Meet Robbie Rodriguez. He was the stuntman for X Statics, the movie. Now he saved the team from Sharon Ginsburg. She attacked because she blamed X Statics for the amputation of her wings. So in comes Robbie Rodriguez with his sentient skateboard to save the day. That's right, sentient skateboard, you heard me. He has no real powers himself, but he has this symbiotic skateboard that acts along with his mental commands, even subconscious thoughts sometimes. So the skateboard once beat him up for cheating on his girlfriend. So next time you see a dude at the skate park, just double check and see if it's Robbie Rodriguez, because you never know. Number seven, Anarchist. Tyke Alakar made his first appearance in X-Force issue 116. The same issue that had Zeitgeist origins as well, actually, which is in part two. If you haven't already seen it, I talk about him. He's the guy who pukes acid. Gross. But we also meet Tyke Alakar in this. So he said he doesn't want to go and give away all his secrets, but he's got something going on with his sweat. It's like acid. He could secrete acid from the pores of his body, and if there's enough of it, say that when he's fighting bad guys, it becomes this form of energy that he's able to blast out. He would blast these acid blasts. Like, how insane is that? The guy makes acid brass knuckles. Brassed knuckles. He was a new addition to the team to replace Sluck, but they weren't a fan of him at first. They thought he was a risk, not a team player, high maintenance, and mentally unstable. Although he pulled through for the team at the end of the day. 
Number six, Cypher. Douglas Ramsey came around with comics with New Mutants issue 13. Now he believes that language is power. And when we first meet him, he's a smart dude in a vest. He's got nice hair. He's talking about deciphering codes. We wouldn't expect too much from him. Maybe he's their guy in the chair, either chair. Now Douglas is actually quite powerful. His ability allows him to communicate with any species. Written or spoken language doesn't make a difference. Doug's got your back, whatever language that is. He can also extend this ability to decipher codes and complex equations, leaving him a pretty powerful asset to any team. Number five, Eye Boy. Trevor Hawkins, again, one of those mutants where you can probably guess his mutation just on his name alone. Eye Boy is, yes, covered in eyes. 57 of them, to be exact. He made his first appearance in Wolverine and the X-Men issue 19. He was one of the new mutants that manifested their power after the Avengers vs. X-Men war. Then he enrolled in the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning. So I boy, okay, big deal. You walk up, you poke all of his eyes out, problem solved. We've played Zelda before, we know how to defeat this guy. Wrong. He is more than meets the eyes. Trevor can of course see you coming, and though his eyes can't shoot laser beams, they do have a plethora of unique abilities. I'm talking microscopic vision, telescopic vision, x-ray vision, night vision, infrared, thermal, chemical detection, you name it, he can see it. All these eyes will see you in any sense. He can even pick up on your body language quite well. Number four, Nature Girl. Lynn Lee made her debut in Wolverine and the X-Men Volume 2, Issue 1. And at first she seems like a regular student, just maybe with antlers. Okay. So Nature Girl can control and bond with animals, which sounds pretty peaceful, if anything. Like if I could control animals, I'd spend all my time in the woods. I'd just take a flute and I'd have a great time. Maybe even pack a lunch. It'd be lovely. With her powers, she can of course do that, but also go further. She can connect to the natural world and control all of nature. Living beings, plants, weather, the very geology of the earth, whatever the case is, she can control it. She can talk to plant lives as well. So if there's any plants that need some watering in your apartment, She'll let you know. And if Nature Girl needs to make a quick escape and there are no birds around to control, she herself can fly only for a limited time. Number three, Gold Balls. Fabio Medina made his comic book debut in X-Men Volume 3, but it wasn't until issue 11 that we got to meet Gold Balls. His powers came to be after somebody tried to rob him, then all of a sudden he started to generate these spheres, these gold balls, out of every part of his body. And whenever these bouncy gold balls hit something, they would make a boink sound which ought to be pretty annoying just as it is. So these gold balls were not made of gold, rather they were produced from infertile eggs. He's pretty outstanding as it is, but currently in the comics, he's referred to as Egg, which is more appropriate after he learned the true nature of his abilities. So Egg and these other members of the five are tasked with resurrecting any mutants that have met their terrible fate. So Egg's eggs are a major key to this process. So he's not just all about, you know, being gold and having balls and stuff. Number two. Tag. Brian Cruz made his first appearance in New Mutants Volume 2, Issue 10. He was actually reborn thanks to that group of five that I just mentioned with gold balls. So Brian's powers are pretty amazing. I can see how one wouldn't expect him to be as powerful as he is. So he has what's called the pariah effect. So if he tags you, hence his name Tag, when he tags you, you become it. Then he uses this form of telepathy to make you emit the signal that causes everybody else to run away from you, just to leave your vicinity. Or they can run towards you, which is even scarier. And he can decide on that number of people affected as well. It could be one person chasing you, or it could be 200. Depends how many are near you. This effect stops after the victim reaches 100 feet. But still, that many people in that radius all running towards you? Like, what if it was Black Friday? It would be an absolute nightmare. Also, these people that are chasing you are fully aware of what's happening. They just can't control it, so... If that's not a nightmare, I don't know what is. And finally, number one, we have Summoner. Making his first appearance in X-Men Volume 5, Issue 2, The Summoner. The Summoner, at first, just looks like a mutant child. It's referring to its mother, so off the bat, you assume, okay, young. He's the son of Bracken and Apocalypse's first horseman of war. He was born 300 years ago on Arako, the highest ranking out of all the other Summoners. There were these wizards that can summon creatures of Arako. Now, his grandmother was taken out by the dark god of Amenth, Annihilation. So that's when the Amenthi daemons destroyed Arako's towers and then attacked and wiped out all those mutants. Now the summoner is not just a pale child, he can summon a horde of elementals as well. Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Multiple Man. James Madrox, he made his first comic book appearance in Giant Size Fantastic Four, issue four. And right off the bat, he seems very soft-spoken. He seems very gentle. I mean, the thing is yelling at him and he's literally like, why do you reject me? Why? Like he's so almost poetic in a way. And then when the thing goes to clobber him, bam, there's multiple more men. 
Now, he wasn't used very much in the X-Men, but he spent most of his days with X-Factor, but this guy is underrated. His powers may seem kind of weak compared to somebody like Jean Grey, but these duplicates can each make a duplicate. At one point, this guy had 40 of him running around town, 40. Now, the duplicates think, they feel, and they act independently, but they're guided by the original James Madrox. In a way, they're guided. They like kind of know what to do. Each of these duplicates manifests one aspect of James' personality, and the longer the time away, the more those traits become extreme. And if one of these duplicates passed away, he can sense that the general area where the body is, which is like the saddest radar ever. This guy could take over the world if he wanted. It would be like that scene from The Matrix, but with more monologues probably. And before we go on to this list of X-Men, you probably wouldn't expect to be that powerful. Guys, if you wanna go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, just right there, just give it a little tap tap, and it helps our studio out quite a bit. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for watching. Let's get back to the list. Lickety split. Number nine, Darwin. We saw this next mutant for a hot minute in X-Men First Class. He was played by Eddie Gathegi, who unfortunately didn't survive too long. See, he threw his life down on the line in order to protect his fellow X-Men. And this was still in the early days too. What a champ. He first showed up in the comics in 2005 with X-Men Deadly Genesis issue two. Armando Munoz looked a lot different than we saw on screen as well. Since he was four years old, he was bald, his arms were super long, and his eyes were changing. He sure looks a little bit different than the young, handsome actor that we saw in the movie. His ability comes in handy a lot, actually, more so in the X-Men movies. See, in the comics, he's practically immortal. His ability once allowed him to survive Hela's death touch. I mean, it's a little bit different than the last time we saw him, that's for sure. Number eight, Caliban. An albino mutant and former member of the Morlocks, Caliban made his first comic book appearance in Uncanny X-Men 148. So he has the ability to track down any mutant. He actually sacrifices himself in the movie Logan, where Stephen Merchant played him. He was also in X-Men Apocalypse for a bit too, played by a different actor. He was played by Tomas Lamarcus. He was originally an ally to the X-Men, but once he became a tracker for Apocalypse in X-Factor issue 24, titled The Fall of the Mutants. So he's pretty powerful, and he's done a lot of cool stuff too. He may seem like a gentle, lanky, pale man, but when Caliban is stressed out in the comics, he gains two additional powers, super strength and fear absorption. So if you put him in a corner, he'll be able to absorb the psionic energy in your fear and use it to power himself up even more. Number seven, Glob Herman, AKA Robert Herman, although Glob is much more fun to say, he made his debut in New X-Men issue 117 and he grew up with a father who despised mutants. So already he's off to a pretty rocky start. So when Glob mutated, his father was just not on board. So his mother drove Glob out to Westchester and just left him for Professor X. Like you leave a baby at a fire station. It's just like, yep, here you go, your problem now. This mutation was interesting. So his skin was this transparent living wax, which he's able to maintain being on fire, which is pretty amazing off the bat. You can light him on fire and he's good to go. That's amazing. He runs with the new mutants now, and although his name is Silly and he's literally a glob, he can also possess powers of super strength and super speed, despite how he may look. So he can get hit by these massive bombs like it's nothing, then he can fight whoever launched that bomb with ease. The X-Men literally once used him as a heat shield once, they strapped Glob to the front of their ship, and it didn't seem pleasant for a man Glob, but he was good. He didn't die or anything. He was just, he had to rest for a bit. Number six, Toad. When you think of the name Toad in relation to a superhero, you're gonna picture something pretty silly in your head. And Mortimer Toneby isn't that far off from what you'd think. He made his first appearance in Uncanny X-Men issue four. So he hops around, which seems silly, but his legs are so strong that he can leg press three tons. And it's not just his legs that are strong, his upper half possesses superhuman strength as well. His arms can lift about one ton. He also has flexible bone structure, regenerative healing factor, infrared vision, and the best part, his 30 foot long tongue can also act as a whip. And it can secrete venom that can give him mind control over your body, and his saliva is acid as well. Number five, Wither. Making his first appearance in New Mutants Volume 2, Issue 3, Kevin Ford grew up thinking that he was cursed, or he was the most unlucky person ever, one or the two. See, his mutant powers started manifesting, and then he noticed it first in his plants, and then he noticed it in his clothes, and then he noticed it in people. So what would happen is his plants would wither. They would wither and they would die. And then his clothes were starting to decay as well. So once his father figures out this mutation, he tries to calm him down, but coming into contact with him, obviously the inevitable happens. He sees the world in this lifeless or decaying way now. See, it's part of this mutation. He can disintegrate all forms of organic matter just by one touch. 
Whatever he touches withers, so now we get his name. It turns into dust within seconds, whatever it is. Now this seems boring, I guess. When you think of it in like a cinematic battle, it's not too exciting, but this guy can take out an entire elite squad just by touching them. I mean, realistically, just send him in always. No one's gonna expect it. All you have to do is get him to fist bump everybody and then bam, just like that. No more bad guys. Number four, Nocturne. This next one, she comes from Earth 2182, where she's the daughter of Nightcrawler and Scarlet Witch. Now, she's got her dad's looks, unfortunately. She's blue, furry, she's got three fingers and three toes. She's got a tail and yellow eyes and pointed ears. Now, sure, she looks like she can take out any bad guy, like she looks like an alien. So she possesses the powers of both of her parents. She can blast off energy bolts, she can climb walls, but what makes her even more powerful is that she has the ability to possess others for 12 hours or one lunar cycle. But once that timer is up, the victim is just completely out of it for 24 hours, just comatose. This super offspring packs a super punch, that's for sure. Number three, Tattoo. Christine Cord made her comic book debut in the new X-Men issue 126. She was a student of the Xavier Institute and she's known as Tattoo, well, because her mutation allows her to display messages or designs on her skin and she can phase through matter, which is also kind of fun. She's pretty awesome. I mean, when you first think of her, you may just think of the skin messages and be like, oh, whatever, maybe she's a spy. Maybe she can be like, send help and then use her skin. Cool, that's good. But check this out. Tattoo actually phased her hand into Cyclops' head once and told him that if she becomes solid, he would not survive to see the end of it. How awesome is that? But she sadly lost her powers during the events of M-Day, but if you ever ran into Christine again, she would probably surprise you with her new ability. When she was released from jail, she joined the new warriors and was given her own stilt man armor, becoming Longstrike. So bam, two and one, talk about underrated. Number two, Banshee. The Screaming Banshee, okay. He made his first appearance in X-Men issue 28. Sean Cassidy was born as the heir to the castle and estate of Cassidy Keep, Ireland. Now, Professor Xavier asked him to join the X-Men at the same time as Thunderbird, and they both stayed as members of the new X-Men. Now, he went on to train the new generation of X-Men and Generation X, but he sadly lost his life during Deadly Genesis when he was trying to stop Blackbird from crashing when it was taken over. So when you think of an X-Men who screams so loud he can hurt people, eh, it's impressive on its own, sure, but his screams are actually stronger than we really think. His screams can actually break through an inch of steel. And with these wings that Professor X developed for him, he's able to harness this power and use his screams as energy to help him fly. So he can do so much more with his voice as well. He can tighten the sound waves around himself to make a sonic shield, and he can influence your subconscious by changing the tones and vibrations of his voice. He can literally change your mind. How awesome is that? What do you mean you want a divorce? Uh... And finally, number one, we have my favorite on the list, Bailey Hoskins. Okay, I have to talk about this poor kid, okay. Strongest X-Men you wouldn't expect, yeah, that is for sure Bailey Hoskins. The only appearance of this kid is in the 2016 miniseries, X-Men, Worst X-Man Ever, which is a pretty cruel name. He was a student at Xavier's School for Gifted Youngsters, and his power is pretty spectacular. He can self-detonate, he can make himself explode, and you would never expect it just by looking at him. I mean, come on. He reminds me of Hogarth from the Iron Giant. He's such a cute kid. The thing is, he can only use this fantastic ability once. And his last issue in the comics was X-Men Worst X-Man Ever, issue five. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in to Top 10 Nerd. I have been your host, Taylor McWaters. Look, drop us a comment down below. Which of these underrated X-Men is your favorite? Because we'd love to check them out as well. Like Bailey Hoskins, that could be a Disney Plus original right there. It would only be five episodes, that's for sure. At number 10, we have Maggot. This guy gives me the creeps and for good reason. He basically has two carnivorous worms on either one of his shoulders that devour anything on command. And they don't do it just as an offensive attack, but so that they can harvest the energy of the target and return it to Maggot's stomach, offering him a temporary boost of strength and durability. Honestly, this guy could come off as cool in some weird way to some people, but to me, his powers are just too gross and too much of a hassle to even be worth it. Most superheroes just have super strength and durability as a base set of powers, and Maggot, well, he has to get his worms to eat someone just to get those basic abilities, and only temporary temporarily too. 
The weirdness factor for this mutant comes from his look, but also from the strange lengths he has to go to just to get on an even keel of power to most of his peers. Number 9. Forget Me Not Forget Me Not basically has the power of me in high school. His abilities allow him to basically be unnoticeable, so much so that he had been on the X-Men roster for 6 years and no one remembered it. As an X-Men, he battled the Brood and fought in the Age of X story and has honestly saved the behinds on more than one occasion before he actually first appeared in X-Men Legacy number 300 in March of 2014. He is literally both real and not real at the same time, which is a concept I am just too dumb to properly explain. He played a key role in X-Force Volume 4 number 10 in 2014 when the X-Men tried to get him to help with one of the key conflicts being quote unquote how can they hope to find a mutant who slips out of memory whenever he leaves their sight? Only problem is, he can't control his powers at all. So how do we prove he even exists? I mean, other than him actually being legitimately written in the comics, his actions and use of things can be perceived, like his use of toilet paper, allowing people to logically conclude that he could exist. Also, his powers were shown to leave distortions on camera records. I don't know how cameras forget him, but it's a comic book so give me a break. A few mutants could detect him, like Phantom X who said forget me not was overweight, which is kind of rude. At number 8 we have Skin. First off, the name. It's like a writer coined this name at 4am after forgetting they had a deadline the next morning. And the powers are equally bizarre. He's basically able to stretch his skin by about 4-6 to six feet and use it to swing around or tie up bad guys. He's like Mr. Fantastic except it's only his skin so I imagine it's like a little less durable and he probably can't pull the guys in as strong as if they were actually his limbs. And in my opinion, the worst of it is that when skin is just hanging out and not actively holding in his skin, it just hangs off of him at its longest length with his skeleton staying the same size, which is kind of gross. It's like a beanbag chair but without any filling and instead of styrofoam beads, it's a full on skeleton and organs. He's also a nightmarish pale blue gray, which I don't know, they could have at least made him look healthy, you know? Anyway, skin. Skin at number 8. Number 7. Eye Boy. Not the first or last mutant to be called the lamest mutant ever, Trevor Hawkins developed his mutant ability after the Avengers vs X-Men War in Wolverine and the X-Men number 19 in 2012. And well, his mutation is that Trevor is covered from head to toe in dozens of eyes. It's creepy. It's weird. It's actually more useful than you might think. Microscopic, telescopic, x-ray, night, infrared, and thermal vision are all things he is capable of. He can also detect chemicals, is an excellent marksman, and is skilled in non-verbal communication. He can basically read other people's behaviors and body language to almost read their minds, predict attacks, and read people's histories. All Sherlock Holmes-like. He can pinpoint weak spots in machines and people, is able to see past illusions and disguises, but to top it all off, the craziest and newest addition to his powers is solar blasts, meaning Trevor can emit intense bursts of bright yellow energy and focused beams of extrastellar force that cause sunburns and radiation poisoning. So yeah, iBoy looks really weird, sure, but he'll tell you your deepest insecurities and then blast you with radiation. So there's that. At number 6 is Choir. Choir aka Arena Clayton wasn't ever part of the X-Men but studied at the school for gifted children which I'm gonna count for the simple reason that I wanted to talk about her. First appearing in the new X-Men issue number 119, Choir just has mouths all over her body and the function for it is very unclear. In some cases she's able to confuse her enemies by shouting things in all directions but that's about it as far as I can tell. And I'm honestly not leaving anything out, that's really it. It's unfortunate because in these cases the use of the word mutant becomes that much more accurate. Like Choir is one of those X-Men that I feel badly for. Superpowers are supposed to be cool and make us wish that we could have them too but this one is just, it's like a curse, you know what I mean? But honestly that sort of goes for everyone on this list and at least Choir seems like a competent and friendly person. So don't get me wrong, she could still have potential. Power doesn't always come from brute force, you know, it can also be achieved by becoming a good strategist or tactician, which she'll have plenty of mouths to yell orders at people, I'm sure, at least. Number 5. Fabio Medina. Although he had thought himself and his powers ridiculous, which they kind of are if we're being honest, Fabio Medina and his battle cry GOLD BALLS is kind of awesome actually. Fabio can produce golden balls of different sizes that shoot out from any part of his body 
and make the sound poink each time they hit something. The golden balls he fires actually seem to bounce. Now, ask me why this is a useful genetic mutation. Go ahead, ask away. But prepare yourself because he gets more weird. After he moved to Krakoa with other mutants, it was discovered that Goldball's balls are actually infertile eggs. And if these eggs are made fertile, it could allow for unlimited resurrection of the mutant race. Yes. So, the golden balls he was firing out of his body at sentinels and antagonists were actually infertile, bouncy golden eggs. I don't like this. But he did become a member of the five that combined their powers to resurrect deceased mutants, and that was pretty cool. At number four is Beak. Beak, or Barnell Bowhusk, is a creation of Grant Morrison, first appearing in his new X-Men series, and he is basically a bird person, but in a more literal sense than any of us asked for. He's got hollow bones, feathers, and a beak, and he can't even fly really. He can just glide briefly, which in my opinion just, it's not worth the hassle of the rest of what he's got going on. He does have talons and long range vision, so there's some kind of offensive potential there. And apparently he's really nice too, which I guess makes up for the fear he strikes in the hearts of many. I like to imagine that Beak was created accidentally when Grant Morrison pitched a character that was half bird, half human, thinking he was on the phone with his character designer, but he'd actually called David Cronenberg instead. Poor Barnell Bohusk, I feel badly for him, honestly. Even his real name, Barnell Bohusk? Anyway. Number three, Dupe. If you have not heard of Dupe, well then allow me to enlighten you. This weird looking bumpy green bean thing will put his hand on your chest. The product of a Cold War US military experiment instrumental in the fall of the Soviet Union. Somehow, Dupe is unable to learn English and as such he speaks in a language all of his own that everyone somehow can eventually understand. Although Captain America says the US government created him in a secret weapons project, he is also apparently from a place called Marginalia. It's it's surprising that he is a member of the X-Men considering he isn't technically a mutant, as far as I know at least. But the most surprising thing is his list of powers. He has possible omniscience, he's strong and durable enough to do battle with and defeat Thor, he can heal from super serious wounds in seconds and resurrect himself, he is crazy fast, he has size alteration, energy projection, psionic abilities, he can perform dupish magic and has the power of the funk. And last but not least, Dupe's body contains a nightmare dimension known as dupe land that he can trap people in and summon monsters from. And if you want to count it, he even has the power of looking like a really angry mix between a lima bean and a pickle. So there's that. At number two is Ugly John. He's not technically part of the X-Men, okay? But he's a mutant who's been on their side for his whole run in the comics. And honestly, I just wanted to include the weirdest Marvel character I've ever heard of. He's got three faces. And that's it. He doesn't last for long, first appearing in New X-Men issue number 114, when he's saved by Wolverine and Cyclops from a sentinel who captures him. After being saved from captivity, he's then probably captured again by the wild sentinels and is critically injured in this incident. I don't know why Ugly John is such an asset to the sentinels, but I imagine it really tested the whole no man left behind philosophy for the X-Men. He really puts the other X-Men in some serious danger as they save him for a second time, this time with his life threatened by injury. And unfortunately for Ugly John, he's so badly injured that Cyclops actually puts him out of his misery. I know. It's very dark, but don't blame me, blame Grant Morrison. I just wish the world had at least given this three-faced mutant a break by allowing him a nicer name. Number one, Bailey Hoskins. How does this normal looking ginger wind up as the number one spot on our list? Bailey Hoskins from Earth TRN656, otherwise known as Exceptional, was from the non-ironically titled X-Men Worst X-Men Ever 5 issue story from 2016. Now what are his powers? Bailey has the greatest power of self-detonation. He can blow up just once and then he moves on to the eternal plane of death. So how do we find out about his mutant ability if he can't really use it? Well, his parents are both mutants. His mother has x-ray vision and his dad can quote unquote fry an egg on his chest if he wanted to. Cool. They visit the Xavier Institute where Beast breaks this poor potential X-Man's young heart by letting him know his utterly depressing power. Not too long after that, when deciding to walk away from the school for mutants, his parents, the only thing he says he has left, 
gets stepped on by a sentinel. He joins the school and basically fails at everything he tries to do using a mech armor, being an intern, joining the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, and the world eventually becomes an apocalypse ruled by a fellow mutant, Riches. In the end, fueled by the fact that he has been a failure his entire life, Bailey finally uses his power to bring down Riches and finally do something actually exceptional. Good job.